Hey, my friends, Marlon Gibbons here. Thank you for joining me at Music in the Making here in my crowded, more crowded than usual studio. Um, I obviously have some gear out that I don't always have out, and uh, that's obviously for the video. Um, I want to kind of cover the topic, or at least what my experience has been, um, out of the box, in the box recording. Uh, I've always subscribed to more of a hybrid approach. I try and use organic instrumentation um, as often as possible. That's not because I believe that's better, that's just been my approach. I have friends that produce entirely in the box and they've achieved <laughs> success that I'll never see. Um, they're incredible at what they do. So this really isn't uh, in the box versus out of the box. Um, both have advantages in, in different applications. Obviously if you're an electronic producer, in the box kind of thing, right? I just wanted to share with you what my approach has been and maybe introduce you to some ideas that you didn't consider before. So let's get at it. Okay, so right off the top, I just want to get this out of the way. I don't proficiently play all these instruments that I'm gonna show you. I do have quite a few instruments that I've collected over the years um, or been handed down to me. Um, and I play a lot of them, but to a, to a degree or to a level that really wouldn't turn any heads and in many cases I would never step foot on a live stage with them. So for example, violin. I, you would never catch me out live trying to play violin. But in the in the studio, um, stop, rewind, record, delete, rewind, delete, rewind. It, you know, it, it's just I can do it as many times as I want until I have have a take that I'm comfortable with or at least I can work with. You can apply the same thing to drums. I'm, I'm really not a, a drummer. Uh, I have rhythm, I can keep time, but I'm not flashy. So for example, I might use, so for example, I might use a sample based uh, drum library and replace the snare with uh, with a real thing, right? And just remove the snare from the, the samples. The same thing with cymbals, um, just to give it a little bit, just to give it that much more of a, a an authentic, I guess, fingerprint. And that's kind of where the whole hybrid thing comes in. Um, I have a band guitar, so it's, it's tuned exactly like a guitar, except that it it really is um, a banjo. It sounds exactly like a banjo. So we'll go through some of the instruments I have and some of the approaches I take to recording those instruments, uh, especially with not being a virtuoso on all these instruments. So some of the smaller percussion instruments I have, obviously yeah, a ton of different kinds of sticks and mallets and that kind of thing. Um, some are handmade, different hand drums, small hand drums. Uh, I have a box full of maracas. That typically is the, uh, the instrument of choice when someone's been away south and they come back and say, I brought you something. It's, <laughs> it's usually a maraca. And continuing on with some of the hand percussion. A triangle off Amazon, $3. There's your jingle bells for Christmas type tracks, uh, my mics, spoon, um, it's given to be, this, this one was given to me by my cousin, more jingle bells, my shakers. Okay, I'll try and be quick here, I don't mean for this to be a, a studio tour. Um, my bass is just a, um, it's just a squire, but I absolutely love it for um, for what I need, the sound, the playability. It's set up really well. Um, I have another guy that sets up all my stuff. My mandolin is an Eastman mandolin. I got it at a scratch and dent sale, so I saved a ton on it. The um, amp in behind is a PV Classic 30. Uh, the speaker has been switched out to a red coat. Again, sounds wonderful. The um, banjitar, or gitjo, whatever you prefer. Uh, basically tuned exactly like a guitar, uh, still get that, that banjo sound. Um, again, I got it at just a ridiculous price. I think I only paid 200 bucks for it at just over. Uh, it was listing for almost six. Um, and then in behind that is my uh, performer, uh, Fender Telly with a humbucker in the neck. Um, my Strat in behind that. My Strat is a Mexican made, but it's, again, I keep it set up really well and uh, just that Strat sound, love it. The Ibanez in behind that um, has two special 58s for pickups. Um, it just sounds beautiful. It's got lots of, uh, it's got lots of tone. Um, and then I have, it's called the Biscuit. I don't think Epiphone makes it anymore. 
but um, I'll, and I'll go through these. I'll pull them out. Um, but it's Dobro Resonator guitar, and uh, it's uh, I use that quite a bit actually, uh, both in the standard guitar tuning, just because it's a different kind of tone, uh, as well as um, slide. And then behind that, it, it kind of resembles like the J two hundred. It's an Epiphone. The cello in behind. Uh, funny story with that. Um, somebody was looking to trade again on one of these websites. Um, was looking to trade. They wanted an electric guitar. I guess they bought the cello thinking they would learn. I don't know if they got frustrated or whatever the case was. Wanted to trade the cello for an electric guitar. So I had a Gibson Studio. Um, straight up trade for the cello. Now it's just a student cello, but um, again, I love it. I've been using it so much. I've only had it a few months, but uh, I, I love it. So I have a few pedals out. I have some tucked away as well. And then beside that, I have my Rev2, um, my DSi, now sequential. Um, I use this most often for synth now as opposed to soft synths. Uh, just, just what I prefer. I'm starting to get comfortable with it. I'm still learning it, but uh, I love it. And then above that, I have the Roland SEO2, mono synth, great for lead stuff. And I have the Eventide H9 Max beside that, which is... The, there's another video coming really soon on that. It's unbelievable. It's kind of a processing tool. Um, I'm sure most of you know what that is, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's this side of the room or to the right of my dog. Okay, so let me just share with you some of the kind of cool creative stuff you can do with various instruments while not having to be really proficient on that instrument. Um, so just as the first example, I guess, um, I've had this fiddle for, for quite a few years now. My dad had bought it for me before he passed. Um, th as I said at the beginning of the video, I would never take this out on stage and try and play it. I can play um, very simple stuff. But if I were doing, say, like a, a kind of a dark um, horror kind of uh, piece of music, it's great for kind of those, you know, trills and long tones. You could, like, you know, hit this big long tone and... Um, just drench it in reverb and reverse it. And just get some really cool, um, almost pad ambient, dark ambient kind of sounds out of it um, with kind of your own unique signature, right? So this bow, in fact, is not the bow that goes with this fiddle. This bow, I think I paid $12 on, on Amazon for. Uh, it's, it's obviously a cheap bow, uh, and I can tell in comparison to the other couple uh, bows that I have. But if you rosin it up really well, um, you can you can get all kinds of really cool um, effects out of it. Uh, bowing everything from guitars to um, to metal to uh, cymbals and stuff. You can get some really cool um, really cool effects out of it. So a cheap bow off Amazon, uh, just endless sounds. A couple other things I have that I use creatively: um, a kazoo. You have a whole horn section with kazoo, right? Um, it's actually pretty fun to play. Uh, kazoo, that's a good one. Um, an Ebo. If you guys don't know what an Ebo is, you definitely go check it out. Um, they're a little expensive to only use once or twice in a blue moon, but um, uh, I have used it on quite a few different things, and it's it's pretty damn cool. And as for this guitar here uh, that was in the end, let me explain how it's set up. It's not set up uh, typically. If you don't know what Nashville tuning is, it's this. It's a really um, light gauge set of strings. It's tuned exactly like a regular guitar in standard tuning, um, except that it's it's the light strings of, say for example, a 12 string guitar has your thick gauge and a light gauge right beside it. The light gauge is an octave up, it's an octave higher. So, so this is still an E, but it's an E higher than your standard tuned guitar. And what this is great for is when you're recording acoustic guitar, this makes a great accompaniment. So it, it has a similar sound to a 12-string acoustic, um, except that some of the characteristics, because you're you're playing two different performances, uh, it just has a, a little bit different sound. And so string three, four, five, and six are an octave higher than your standard guitar, but one and two, so the E and the B. Are, stand, are the same as, as your your uh, your regular tuned acoustic. So that's just a D chord, but 
you see how it has just kind of a different voicing, right? So it sounds really beautiful with, um, with like I said, a, uh, a regular acoustic guitar. So there's different ways you can set that up. You can buy uh, strings for a 12 string acoustic and essentially you have two sets of strings, one for your regular guitar and, and then you keep the other strings for your Nashville tuned guitar. Um, and, and I think it's Diodario that sells a pack specifically for Nashville uh, tuning. I don't, I don't know of any other brands that do, but um, yeah. So that's that's this guitar and banjo guitar or Git Joe. Uh, as I said, it's tuned exactly like a, a real guitar. Um, if you're looking for the kind of the picking um, characteristic of a banjo, you can still pick with it. Um, Obviously it's going to sound a bit different than if you had the finger picks on and we're doing kind of that, that tumbling thing where you tumble the triplets really fast and you get that 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 uh, really nice flow to it. Um, definitely not in my wheelhouse, but uh, it does what I need it to on, um, on certain projects to get the, the real tone. <laughs> I have a box full of different keys um, and I'll use them in all kinds of different uh, different approaches sometimes it's just underlay like really really subtle um, supportive elements where you're just kind of um, hitting one kind of note or, or key as a put like a obviously with a bit more <laughs> a bit more care than that but um, basically just using the, the key and tone of the harmonica to support something that's going on as opposed to being, um, as I said earlier, a featured instrument. Um, it, not very often will I try or, or play the, the whole, um, you know, articulate kind of like bluesy kind of thing. Um, a lot of times it's too much and gets in the way. And although some harps can be kind of expensive, uh, if you're not a harp player, uh, this one was uh, over a hundred bucks, but you can pick them up for 15, 20 bucks. Uh, that would, again, do. And this thing here, um, there's a few different names for it. Uh, a mouth harp, Ozark harp. Um, it's horrible to play because you have to put your teeth on the metal to get the resonance to, and I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna do it on camera. Um, but when I was learning how to play it, I can't tell you how many times I would hit the little piece of metal and it, it, it slaps back and how many times it caught the corner of my mouth and it hurts like hell. Um, not to mention, it's just an uncomfortable instrument to play, but uh, you all know the sound. It's definitely one of those things you're not gonna pull it all the time. Um, this isn't one I enjoy, I enjoy playing. Pocket trumpet, they call it. Um, it was about 200 bucks on Amazon. Um, again, again, with a lot of these instruments, um, I'm really beginner level with this. Uh, I, I have put some time into it. Uh, I'm gonna get the basic scale kind of thing. Um, but with the assistance of Melodyne and a, and a bunch of layering, you can get it to sound not too bad, especially if you're, again, um, using it in tandem with, with sample libraries. Um, not too bad. So let me just quickly say again that I'm not suggesting that an organic approach using real instruments is a better way to go than all in the box or using sample libraries. In fact, I have spent thousands of dollars over the years and continue to buy sample libraries uh, uh, because the fact is that incredible pieces of music exist out there that have been done respectively in each of those kind of worlds. So that's kind of it. I hope some of it inspired you to <laughs> think outside the box. Sorry, I just said that. So yeah, just have a different creative approach to it. And it doesn't have to be um, a musical performance approach. It can be kind of a, a sound design approach too, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and it just gives a, a dimension to uh, to your compositions that you might not find in a, in a sample library. Obviously, I, I'm not speaking for every library out there, every publisher out there, uh, as far as what they want. Um, I think they just want really well-produced tracks, uh, no matter what your approach, in the box, out of the box, hybrid, whatever. So let that kind of be the biggest message in this video is that just write really well 
produced tracks, no matter how you do that. That's where the kind of magic is. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, we've just broken 3,000 on the channel now, and a lot of you have been with me since the first couple hundred. Um, and even those of you that are coming on board now um, and sending me messages, I really do appreciate it. And I think we have an awesome network here. Don't forget to find me on Facebook as well as Instagram and, uh, and we'll connect there too. Cheers, my friends. We'll see you next week.